With a slew of video on demand services entering the South African market, what kind of disruption could we see in the TV space? Will you be watching us on this in the future, or will you still need to rent a television, maybe buy a television in the day of disposable TVs? This is The Money Makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Tonight I'm joined by a veteran of the TV industry, Theo Rutstein, non-executive chairman of Telljoy, to find out more. You started your Telljoy business in the year I was born, and that's long before TV even arrived in South Africa. Are you a great visionary, or do you just get lucky? Uh, well, I don't describe myself as a great visionary. Visionary, I guess that it is someone who looks out for an opportunity and tries to grasp it when it's there. Now, but, uh, take me so, back to those days. I mean, Forster okay. wouldn't allow uh, television into South Africa. He was terribly concerned about uh, the huge disruptive influence television would have. And eventually, they, they bowed to public pressure. And what was it, 1975, 76, the TV yeah, finally arrived? 75 test, 76 formal. Mm. Uh, Bruce, the bottom line really was that the Americans landed on the moon in June 1969. We were one of the very few countries in the world that didn't have television. Our neighbour, which was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, uh, had television. Mm -hmm. You could at that stage buy around $2 for one rand. We might not have had a very equal population, but perceptually we were quite wealthy. Difficult to understand why we were practically the only country in the world that didn't have television at that time. So you anticipated so it was likely to come then? Exactly. Kind of thought, this is inevitable, it cannot be resisted, and why would it be resisted anyway? So we decided that uh, we'd like to set up a television company, didn't want to become retailers, you know, competing with retailers over a period of time. So how would one do that without necessarily investing too much money? Mm went to the UK, saw rental companies, came back with the idea that, well, that's great. We can set up a rental company. It will be unique within the South African environment. We don't really have to do anything other than promote the idea until TV finally comes, and then we would have a positioning in that field. So how are you paying the bills in the meantime? Well, we weren't doing nothing. We had other <laughs> businesses. I was yeah. involved in property development at that mm. time. I had a company called Bendor Properties. Uh, which was doing mainly township development at that stage. But uh, came back with this idea, ran a, a big ad in the newspapers. In those days, there were four major Sunday papers. We took ads full page in all of them. And uh, it was along the lines, where will you be on the loneliest night of the year when the streets are deserted because everyone's watching TV? Will you be in your home or your neighbors? Um, that produced quite a lot of uh, sensationalism. We got a lot of headlines out of that. A lot of people came back and said, well, this is rubbish. And so we ran another ad that said, TV or not TV, <laughs> doesn't really matter. You don't pay anything until the set is installed and receiving local transmission. But in the meantime, sign a contract with us and we'll guarantee you'll have a set for the opening night. For many people, the idea of renting a TV is bizarre, but as a proportion of household income in those days, t TVs were a big investment, weren't they? Well, there were two factors. It was. It was probably the third most expensive item that you were going to have behind your home and your car. Uh, and apart from that, there was no knowledge at all as to how reliable the product would be. So the question of service was important mm -hmm. and incorporated into the rental idea was same day service, picture guaranteed daily. Uh, if you call before 10 in the morning, you'd get it uh, repaired or, or is replaced this, on Does the, the business day. model still exist in the rental TV market? Because TVs nowadays are kind of disposable. They're, they're thin and plasticky, and you whip them off the wall and replace them with a brand new one if something goes wrong. That's true. Uh, so we've evolved the model. Uh, you know, rental doesn't have the same uh, benefit as it had in those mm. days. But what we do now is we offer an alternative to fixed credit. In other words, we're not locking in anyone to having been committed to a period of time. If they're buying on credit, whether it's on a credit card or whether it's by way of higher purchase, which is not so fashionable anymore, point is you have a commitment, you have to pay it off, and you're committed to the full price mm. of the product no matter what happens. What we've done is that it's a, an opportunity to have it for as long or short as you want, you can upgrade or downgrade within a month. You're not committed to debt, other than in respect of the period that you've actually used it. You can return it, as I said, upgrade or downgrade any time. And the benefit is it still incorporates service. Mm. It incorporates all those other things that are go, go in with it. And 
if you stay with us for the agreed period, you get ownership without charge. No, but, but that's, that's, so the, that's point. the point. It's because you don't want these things back at the end of five years, I suppose, we because they're kind of obsolete really quickly. Well, we they? don't really mind, uh, Bruce, because you know people do rent for shorter periods. They've got the ability to change at any stage on one month's notice during the period. And probably as much as 15 to 18% mm -hmm. of the customers do give it back uh, over periods ranging between two and 18 months. I mean, at, at some but point we don't also, mind, yeah. they're recyclable. I mean, uh, we can put uh, them yeah. out and there is technological obsolescence. So we replace, but we also don't only do TV. So yeah, but that's the point yeah. because mm -hmm. uh, the thing that strikes me, many young people starting out in business today are fairly single minded in their focus and they go mm -hmm. out and do one thing. Mm -hmm. But the more people I've talked to who've been successful in business mm -hmm. and successful in, a bus mm -hmm. in business over a long period of time, mm -hmm. I discover I have multiple irons in the fire. Mm -hmm. The irons that don't get hot get, get removed and, and cast aside, but the irons get kept hot. Sure. Um, you went into the cellular business, you went to property development, into television rental, uh, and into evolving the credit models around that. We even tried solar. That wasn't such a great bath. <laughs> no, so, 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 so uh, have yeah. you tried solar and, uh, and it's bomb? Yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, we when, when do you pull the plug on the project? When you don't see the opportunity to really recover your investment within a reasonable time frame, it's kind of like you need to look at this thing and say, it's not pretty, we've lost a lot of money, and on solo we took a 20 million bath, so it wasn't very nice. But you kind of look at this and say, Take the loss, take the north. Because a lot of people are tempted into solar, aren't they? I mean, so solar we is were. perceived to be uh, the South African growth business of the 21st century. See, I thought I was clever. I foresaw television, I foresaw <laughs> and beat <laughs> cellular. We came in earlier. I thought I'd done that again with solar. <laughs> But, you know, mistakes occur. I mean, you talk to Grant Patterson, who's big in the solar business yeah, with the, as the it. local chairman of an American solar company. Yeah. And he says times are tough because it's not about load shedding. It's actually about electricity prices. If we can get electricity prices rising faster, then solar uh, has got an opportunity. Yeah, and as soon as you think you've got this right, then ESCOM come right, comes <laughs> right. <laughs> no more outages. So <laughs> lots of things go into it. But we, uh, mm. our uh, mm. foray was really mainly into... Uh, water heating, which involved plumbers yeah. and technicians and all kinds of stuff. No, but those variables, anybody who's got a home understands the variables that can mm. come with, with mm. dealing with, with service mm. providers. Mm. Um, how influential was Uncle Saul in your life? Saul Kersner, you're his nephew, right? Well, I am, uh, and quite proud of it. <laughs> uh, but in terms of uh, direct involvement, only uh, through the fact that he was in the family, he was kind of like an icon in the family. He's only six years older than I am. But he was the sporting hero, and he was he sporty. Oh, he was great. He was a, bo a South African boxer and wrestler. He was. That's how you get into the casino business. You can fight. You can fight. He can fight your way. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but I mean, it's a. Uh, so, so, so he was visionary. Was a, so uh, absolutely, he was, a, he was a, a, a an icon, and for me, a mentor. Um, you know, we became a lot closer as the age difference narrows, mm. and that happens. <laughs> although the years don't narrow, mm. the age difference mm. narrows over a period of time. Uh, and today we're pretty close, particularly now that he's sold out of the businesses, uh, he's got a lot more time. So we spend a lot of time together now. But, but it's, it's interesting to have that influence in a family. And so mm. many people starting out in business today are maybe first generation entrepreneurs. They mm. don't have that level of mentorship. Where do people That's get the help the from? I mean, you had Uncle Saul to phone if you needed to, or you came uh, for, for Friday night supper and he, he told a tale that you know, struck a chord yeah, no, or whatever the case was. That's true. But I think that my real mentorship came a lot earlier than, or there was a, a, a greater influence than Saul in that, in that my parents were involved in business. Uh, my dad was, I think he was a good entrepreneur. He came out as a Hebrew teacher, uh, ended up uh, developing some properties, got involved in a whole lot of different uh, arenas. And he was really, I think, a good entrepreneur. Um, perhaps took on too much debt at certain stages, but that happens. Yeah. Um, but uh, the real issue was that at the dinner table, and in those days we used to sit down to fairly formal dinner, we used to get together as a family, and my mum and And so people imported televisions and ruined family dinners forever, of course. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> it did. It, disrupted, it <laughs> certainly disrupted conversation. Uh, but the, uh, the thing was that they used to talk about, my mom was involved in w as well, so they used to talk about business. And kind of when I got to university and people were talking about turnover and gross profit and, you know, those things that make up a business, I was astounded that a lot of my friends didn't have a clue what they were talking about. 
And I think that the ability to talk about things at home, wherever one is, and in whatever business it might be, not necessarily as a chief executive or anything like that, I think it provides a good grounding if kids are exposed to whatever it is at an early age. It certainly was influential in my life. But, but far too many South Africans, the only conversation they ever have about money is about the scarcity of money and the, mm. the fear of not having enough. Mm. Um, so money, rather than becoming a great enabler, mm. is actually something of an intimidating mm. factor. Mm. You mean, do, you, do, you, do you guide people nowadays? Well, uh, personally, yes. But just uh, in response to what mm. you've just said, I don't think that people should be talking about money either as a great factor or a fear factor. Let's talk about business mm. and what it is to really make something and to actually feel, uh, you know, whether it's uh, successful or, or not, much better successful than not, <laughs> but to just inspire the, the ability to think and do something, mm. you know, get people moving. Money might be the objective. It should be the result of what you do. Not sure that it's the right thing to specifically aim for. No, no, not necessarily. Mm. But it's a nice byproduct, isn't it, of effort? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to, to to mentorship and 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 coaching, perhaps, mm. I mean, mm. do you do a lot of that sort of thing? I do some, uh, probably not as much as I could or should. I assist Orjet to uh, have a mentorship pro program, and there are a number of people within the ordinary environment that I, uh, I am in. So, you know, people within the organization, people that I come across. I wouldn't describe myself as a great mentor by what I say or teach. I'd like to think that through the way I am, mm. I, I help at least the people around us in the business. But, but what you're seeing around you, and a lot of people are really concerned about the future of South Africa. They're mm. really perplexed about the fact that we, we're not seeing the growth that sure. we so desperately need to create the jobs, to alleviate the unemployment, to sure. alleviate social crises further down the line. What's your, what's your sense? Bruce, you know, I think South Africans are either at the top of the world or the bottom of the mm. heap. I mean, we don't often see things uh, at a, you know, when the pendulum is sort of in the middle. It's either at one end or the other, and we're either uh, joyous or really sad, depending on where we are in the scale. These days, we're, we're not in a happy place. That's pretty clear. But we still wake up in the morning, and we look at the sun, and we step outside our houses and should understand there is nowhere in the world that we could live at an equivalent level the way that we do over here, even at, you know, unfortunately the lower income people also, I think, have it a lot better than they would have in many other places in the world. So we have a good life, uh, lifestyle. We have anxieties about where the future is going. I think the political environment certainly scares me. I think it scares anybody who watches TV and sees people See, jumping around again, in Parliament. It's TV. And again, it's TV. Okay. TV is the source of all uh, evil. BJ Forster was right on that uh, point. Yeah, but we show <laughs> the stock exchange looking quite good. We show some of the businesses that are growing very nicely. So it's a little bit of a balance. And if it really gets too bad, there's some nice entertainment pe programs where you can watch people killing each other. <laughs> Always. Oh, you don't have to look, see it in look Paris. It the <laughs> <laughs> Thea Rutstein, we just leave it there. But thank you so much for coming in tonight. Thea Rutstein, who is the non-executive chairman of Tell Joy, a fascinating dialogue diverse business life. Also some great insights and learning at the feet of one of the masters of South African business. Thank you for watching. There'll be more Moneymakers tomorrow. Till then, bye-bye for now.